We start today with the international crisis that is now very much a South Florida story. Right now, a scramble to staunch the street violence in Haiti's cities and neighborhoods, help the people whose families are watching from here helpless, and brace for the possibility of a Florida-bound mass exodus. The first flights of a UN air bridge between Haiti and the Dominican Republic this morning are complete, and to get that is to get in humanitarian aid. The U.S. Embassy is working to fly American citizens home. Evacuations made difficult without an open airport. Sheila Sherfalis McCormick is currently the only Haitian American in Congress. She is a Democrat representing a big part of Broward and Palm Beach counties and is, as you see, right here with us today. Congresswoman, it is great to have you at the table. You've been with us via Zoom, but so great to have you here. Thank you for having me. You've been very vocal this week about uh, events going on. You've called on the prime minister to resign. He did. He said he would yes. soon. Uh, a trans, a transitional government, which is a plan in the works. And you've called on a multinational force to go in, another plan in the works. All these plans in the works, but nothing is changing. Give us your sort of this morning's overview now that you see what is not happening. Well, I think right now we all recognize that what's going on in Haiti is actually a national security issue for all of us. Mm -hmm. But the amount of suffering that has been going on for the last year and a half has really just been absorbing it. And so what we're trying to do right now is security. Security is number one. And so that's why it's important that that multinational force is well funded. And so we're trying to work to make sure we get that funding out for them. So the multinational force you're talking about is the one Kenyan-led multinational force? Yes that is is really stalling it's stalling it is stalling well one of the biggest problems we have with the multinational force right now is for congress to release the funding the fund has already been um, appropriated the funds have already been agreed to by the administration but we have some republicans who are holding up releasing the funds the um, they have been telling us that they're not getting all the information but we've been rushing to get the information and this holdup has been actually since october well, I, I know this week, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said there was $300 million allocated. It's 200 and 100 off the top of my head. I can't remember mm -hmm. which part, but, but solely dedicated to this effort. Mm -hmm. Well, altogether, it's $300 million for the effort, and $33 million is going to go towards humanitarian aid because so many people are facing a famine. So we, they requested $50 million initially to start the process, and the $40 million is being held up. So only $10 million has been allocated. And what's terrible about, about the situation is that the international community has actually put their money forth. We are the only ones holding up our half of the bargain. So bring it home for me. I mean, you, you have family there and, and friends there. Have you spoken to them? What is, you know, we're watching, CNN actually has the first reporter on the ground there this morning. We're starting to get that video and, and see, and there are neighborhoods, they're reporting that neighbors and communities are fortifying their own streets yeah. against yeah. these gangs. What, what are you hearing from um, your loved ones? It's heart-wrenching to hear from your family the fear they have. Um, I have family members who are saying that they have their guns in their room to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And the Haitian people are just crying out for help. And the truth is the gangs are getting stronger. And that's why it's so important that the United States takes a really affirmative stance because we can't allow in our backyards for gangs to feel like they're stronger. Tell, tell me what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. Do you mean boots on the ground. Marines are there uh, mm -hmm. to help with evacuations, not in, in a fight. Mm -hmm. But what, what do you mean by the U.S. has to help? Well, speaking. we have to make sure the funding is there, but take a strong stance as Americans that we're not going to allow gangs or the gang element to be in our backyard and to take over. We've been seeing propaganda videos of the gangs where they have ammunitions in their arms waiting for this force, but for them to think that they can actually terrorize people in our backyards, Haitian people, that they can actually have drugs going through Haiti into the United States is unfathomable. We have to actually show who we are as leaders of the free world that we will not tolerate in our backyards for gangs to take any government. So let's talk about those gangs for a minute. We've been calling them gangs. The, the different people that we've had here talking about it call them warlords, armed militias. Mm -hmm. how, how do you describe these, these gangs? It's a kind of a loose federation mm -hmm. of different factions under one umbrella and one de facto leader, Jimmy mm -hmm. Cherizier, uh, who's called Barbecue mm -hmm. on the streets. Um, he, he clearly is in control at right. the moment. Well, I personally call them terrorists. They've been terrorizing the Haitian people for more than a year and a half. Even Americans who've been going to Haiti, they've been kidnapping them. We've seen that sex has been used as a violence, ag violence against them when rape, raping family members. So they're actually terrorizing anyone who comes into the country. So, so they are publicly saying now mm -hmm. They are not going to participate in a transitional government. They want amnesty. They want some kind of control. What, 
what do you see playing out on, you know, what their issue is, is they don't see government there or mm -hmm. here as helpful to the people. And, and I just, I want to throw out there that we've interviewed some Haitian Americans here, at, we were at the consulate mm -hmm. this week, who actually understand how and why these people are frustrated. Maybe not, they're not behind the actions they're taking, but certainly behind the intent of getting what the government is there now out. Well, I can understand frustration, but I cannot understand lawlessness mm -hmm. that actually terrorizes and recruits children to hold huge guns when you're forcing children to get into gangs. I can't excuse that. And so one of the things that I called for this week is during the negotiations for the um, presidential council is that you have no criminal elements in that negotiation because they do want to be part of the country. They do want to run the country. But how can we have credibility with the Haitian people when we are supporting gangs and terrorists? The same people who are coming through, kicking you out of your house, killing you, raping your family, now want to run the government? Is there, a, it, this is what I've, I've heard and seen evidence of as we report, the gangs came to power really through violence mm -hmm. in the last, since the assassination of Jovenel Moise, the president. Um, prior to that, administrations in Haiti actually, in a shadowy way, kind of used these people as their own what, security force? A and I'm not sure people understand how that power didn't come from nowhere. Right. I mean, it was something that was building up even after we saw um, the gangs come into play with the military and the influence there. It has been something that has been um, slowly increasing. So it's no surprise that we're in this situation. But what we have to focus on right now is how do we come out of this situation? And I think it really is going to be prevention. We have to look at the root cause today. The root cause today is instability and not a real government. So if we can get the funding for the MSS, get that transitional government, that will start giving us a full wave movement. But if we sit back, and start fortifying our borders and saying, hey, let's make sure that we send you know, extra troops to the shoreways. I think what we're doing there is kind of like wishing for help or wishing for something not to happen, but it's going to happen. So I've been calling on all of the Republican colleagues, my Republican colleagues, and even the governor to join us in pushing the Republicans to release the funding, because that's how we would prevent the issue, by dealing with the root cause. All right, Congresswoman, we have a, a break, a quick break. I, I do want to talk a little bit about the expectation of that kind of exodus. When we come back, stay tuned. We will back in a Welcome back. We are continuing our conversation with Congresswoman Sheila Sherfalis McCormick about Haiti and the very up to the minute crisis that is reverberating in South Florida this week. We reported this week, mm -hmm. uh, despite ramping up of efforts on both the federal and state level, which we'll talk about also with a state rep in the next segment. Um, that there is no sign, no intel, no evidence of a mass exodus at this point. Have, mm -hmm. have things changed, do you know, differently? No, there's no signs of it. What we're really looking at is preventing it. And the reason why is because the situation on the ground is so dire. You have people who have been stuck in their house now for almost mm -hmm. 11 days, and they're running out of food, they're running out of water. And so people are looking at just the compounding nature of what's going on, and we're trying to prepare for the worst. So people, I mean, you speak to people, what, daily there? Yes. Do they want to leave? Is that something that they're looking to for their own safety or did they really have faith that they can wait it out? Well, no one wants to leave their homeland, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody has faith and that's why everyone's watching the news, trying to hear of hope, any sign of hope. Any conversation we have in the U.S. really does give hope to people of Haiti. So we are really trying to do everything we can to help Haiti and let them know that we are in the works of helping them. So no one has to leave their home. No one has to take to the sea. Taking to the sea is really a, a gamble for anyone in their entire family oh, because you can literally die. More likely than not, you will not survive that trip. And well, so, yeah, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we certainly have, I mean, I don't know if we can queue up video, but mm -hmm. we certainly have covered over and over in just this week, 64 Haitian nationals were repatriated, intercepted off the Bahamas in a boat that we, we didn't see them on the boat. We saw the boat. And if five people were on the boat, it looked like it might have been crowded. And that's hugely dangerous. Exactly. So most people know the reality of it and they're just waiting for that hope and we can give it to them. Like I mentioned, we are the leaders of the free world and we need to act like it, especially in these situations. You know, leaders of the free world, we, um, according to the UN report, supply mm -hmm. those gangs with most of their firepower and mm -hmm. guns and ammunition. Is there anything being done to take a look at that research last year mm -hmm. and, and stop that? 
Definitely. Uh, one of the things that I did, I took a tour of the Port of Miami to see what can we do to stop the guns from going. Well, it's the Miami River where yes. they go yes. from. The port has high-tech security, right. river not so much. So we took a p tour of the entire um, space, and we were looking at how can we fund to have more technology there. What can we do working with the government also in Haiti and the Dominican Republic so that they can be captured? So whatever slips through our hands here, we can capture it there. And so looking at the dynamics of what's going on, the thing that surprised me the most is that when it leaves here, if we can't find them, um, it actually goes to the Haitian government and they receive it. So my question became immediately is how can the actual police force have less guns than the gangs when the Haitian government receives it? And so that kind of rung bells for me about the corruption going on. But on this side, we're doing everything we can to have more um, technology to actually capture it before it goes out. Can, can we go back to that and yes. sort of flesh that out a little yes. bit? The Haitian government receives illicit weaponry, contraband, mm -hmm. and the gangs on the streets have them connect those dots. So that's what I wanted to find out because let's say some guns slip through our fingers here with our technology. Once it gets to the port, the Haitian government has the right and the responsibility to actually go in and search. And whatever they confiscate is supposed to go into the hands of the actual government. So that's when I started digging a little further. So how is it that the gangs have this type of ammunition? How, do th how are they outpacing when it comes to ammunition the government? And so that's when you start wondering about the complicity of the Haitian government. Um, even the prime minister, what's really going on here? And this has been going on now for more than a year and a half. And that's where you saw the calls for um, Prime Minister Ariel Henry to step down because a lot of things weren't adding up, especially when it came to security and the strength of the gangs. How were they getting so strong in so that time period? So then how, you know, pro prognosticate that out into mm -hmm. the future, how does this transitional government, if it ever gets into place, a nine-member panel, mm -hmm. civil society, possibly religious leaders, business people, how do you prevent mm -hmm. the chronic corruption like that? Well, first step is to make sure you don't have any gang members who are affiliates who are on that board. And so that was one of the first things we started calling out for. Now, I, I believe that we are going to have this, um, this transition government completed very soon. And once we have credible people at the table who would actually hold responsibility, that's where we feel more empowered that they'll do the right thing. But until now, we haven't really had credible people at the table who people see as legitimate and who people actually believe in. And so that's what the hope is with this panel. Can you uh, break a little news with us? Do you know anybody who might be on that transitional government yet? I cannot. You, you know, but you can't say. I cannot say. OK, fair enough. I respect that. Um, but, but you know I'll be asking you again <laughs> soon. Um, if we have a couple of minutes, we do. Um, I want to ask you about another huge news topic, the vote mm -hmm. in Congress yes. overwhelmingly to ban TikTok from U.S. app companies if mm -hmm. it does not divest its Chinese owner, mm -hmm. ByteDance. You voted yes. Yes. And this was a really interesting vote because there are Republicans who voted no. There are Democrats like you who voted yes. Mm -hmm. What was behind that vote? Well, national security. When we see our relationship with China, especially the adverse relationship that's growing even exponentially every single day, we knew that, or I knew, that we need to protect our children. We need to protect all Americans from propaganda that might be coming through TikTok. And so having um, the Chinese having them divest from any Chinese investors or the government is so imperative to make sure that we are protecting ourselves from a national security point. And that's why I voted yes to it. Not to say that we're banning TikTok, because that's not it. But if you're going to be sending out information and influencing the United States, we have to protect ourselves from a national security perspective. And, and TikTok, I, I guess part of your conversation and your decision was the immense amount of business done on TikTok. Mm -hmm. um, U.S. markets are on TikTok. TikTok here employs tens of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And how did that play into that decision? Well, it played into not just the employees, but also their influence on our children, influence on us and how we live as Americans. And so we have to be able to protect ourselves the same way that China protects itself, the way that the rest of the world protects themselves. And so when we realize that there could be a potential risk to national security, we have to take those affirmative steps. And with the C Chinese Communist Party being involved in TikTok, I mean, we're just sitting ducks at that point. We're just hoping they don't use their influence, which we should never be in a position of hoping. We need to ensure that 
national security is first and that no one could have that influence on us if they choose to use it. You know, that is just one component of a very big issue, this election of misinformation. You see that on X and Twitter and Facebook and on the streets and my own very smart friends and yeah. it's, it's a bit scary. We see it yeah. every single day. It's interesting because, you know, I have uh, teenagers and kids in college and before that vote, my daughter called me and she said to me, hey mom, how are you voting on this bill? And I said, what? She you was think? lobbying you. Right. <laughs> so that's exactly what I said to her. And then she started telling me how this is a violation of her First Amendment rights. Mm. And I said, who is telling you to do this? She was literally reading the script that she saw on TikTok before she entered. Wow. And so I said, this is the impact we're talking of, which could be positive. I think that everybody needs to learn how to advocate and we need every generation involved. However, what if the Chinese uh, Communist Party decided to influence our communities, our children in a different way? You know, so that's what we have to be thinking that this may be positive because you're getting everyone involved, but what if they choose to use it for negative things? And that's where we said, no, you must divest. Something that we should be thinking of with every little thing. Exactly. Year. Congresswoman yes. Sheila Sherfulis-McCormick, great to have you at the table with us. Appreciate your time. Thank you for having me.